Hello, everyone. Our presentation today will be on how to not lose your keys. Uh, obviously, uh, not any keys here. Uh, 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 we will be talking uh, about cryptographic keys specifically. And uh, we want to uh, look at uh, how to not lose keys, especially when you are using them, as you will see. First, a quick introduction of myself. Uh, my name is Morat Chafawi. I'm a cloud solutions architect at, uh, at Intel. Uh, I'm actually a Cisco uh, alumni. I joined Intel in 2017 after 16 years in Cisco. Uh, when I was at Cisco, I was uh, uh, involved uh, in the security of the Cisco call manager and the WebEx suite, and uh, in general, all the uh, Cisco cloud, the security of the uh, cloud solutions uh, in Cisco. Uh, and I was also part of uh, uh, a joint program between Cisco and San Jose State University, a program that started a cybersecurity master program. Uh, I was part of, uh, of, 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 that, uh, uh, of the inception of that program. Uh, now that I'm at Intel, uh, my role consists primarily in architecting middleware, that is services, libraries, that expose uh, security features in, C in Intel CPUs uh, to, uh, to, the to, uh, to other software, uh, specifically or um, uh, specifically cloud native uh, in cloud native environments. So first, what problem are we solving? So uh, in this figure or this diagram, uh, we see the life cycle of a cryptographic key. Uh, so on the left, you see uh, key is protected in, in kind of a vault, uh, or uh, the technical term is key management system. So key management system is with what is uh, typically used to store keys at, at rest when they are not used. And key management systems are typically backed by a hardware security module, or HSM, uh, which, uh, which uh, protects further the, uh, those crypt, uh, sensitive previous keys, uh, uh, cryptographic keys. Keys can also be protected on the server uh, so that would be on the right on the on the diagram on the server where they are actually used so the keys can could be encrypted uh, either by another key um, or by uh, or with a passphrase uh, by an admin for example so th there is a way to protect keys also when they are uh, at rest on on the server right uh, and going back to the key management system when the key is actually used by the uh, by the the application by the user application, the key can be transferred from the key management system to the application through a protected tunnel like TLS using one of the protocols that are used for uh, uh, managing keys uh, over a network like KMAP or uh, the protocol that uh, that Vault uses, for example, or AWS KMS or, a, uh, or the Azure KMS, for example. And typically keys are protected also when they are in transit uh, uh, as I mentioned over, like, for example, a TLS tunnel. So this is the gap that we have today in, in protecting those keys. Ultimately, the keys need to be loaded into RAM so that the application can use the key. And that's where the key is exposed. And that is the problem that we are trying to uh, address in this presentation. Right? Uh, because the key can will be in RAM and uh, along uh, potentially with other applications, um, might be mal malware software, right? Um, so how do we protect the key when it is uh, loaded in RAM and in use? That's the technical term for, for, uh, for, for this state. Okay, so why is in use a concern, right? Uh, I think hard to believe. So that, that was a, a, a security problem that happened a few years ago for those who remember. Uh, where keys uh, could be, uh, because of a flow in the uh, OpenSSL implementation, uh, uh, attackers uh, were able to recover the private key of, of a server. The other problem with, uh, or the other concern when the key is actually used is that the OS and the hypervisor, basically all the privileged software can itself have, it's software, it's still software, so it can have vulnerabilities. So. Uh, even it it uh, protects or isolates, it does a good job, uh, or they do a good job at protecting or isolating different applications. Uh, they, they they can still be vulnerabilities that would allow malicious software to access uh, the content of of another uh, of another application. 
and of course we have the problem of malicious administrators who can easily recover uh, the content of, of RAM because they have access to the servers. Uh, and uh, keys also are at risk because they there could be operational mistakes. Like if someone, for example, makes a VM snapshot of an application that uh, that contains a cryptographic key, and if that snapshot is uh, not adequately protected, then keys can be uh, disclosed to malicious parties. Okay, so what we the problem that we are tackling basically is that we want to protect keys in all states at rest. And we, as we have seen, the industry have uh, good uh, 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 solutions for that. We want to protect keys in transit. Same thing, uh, good protections there with uh, with encrypted uh, tunnels, transport tunnels. But we also want to protect keys in use when they are at runtime, when they are used in RAM. Okay. So what we will do next is uh, look at what solutions we have today to address the concern of protecting keys at uh, uh, at runtime in use um, and look at their constraints and limitations. So there are solutions. Okay, so, but there are basically two, two solutions or two techniques to protect uh, uh, cryptographic, especially uh, sensitive cryptographic keys uh, during use at runtime. The first technique is to use an attached hardware security module, an attached HSM. And the second solution is to use a network HSM, which is uh, which is uh, usually a network HSM is usually your KMS. Okay. So first, let's start with the hardware security module with HSMs. So HSMs are uh, physical, separate physical hardware that gets connected to the server, where the keys are stored. Right, and then uh, cryptographic processing is done inside the HSM, and HSM has or provides an interface to uh, client applications that they can use. And the only way to access the uh, the keys in the HSM is through that interface. So if the key is is uh, provisioned into the HSM in a way in such a way that it doesn't or it shouldn't or it mustn't uh, leave the HSM then the only way to uh, uh, do cryptography with those keys is to use the API that the HSM uh, exposes to the cloud to the sorry to the client application uh, and that interface uh, is typically uh, called uh, is pkcs11 uh, so it's the standard uh, interface that most HSM support, uh, H other HSMs or HSMs can support also custom interfaces but pkcs11 uh, is the one that is uh, the, the standard uh, that that uh, most HSM support. Uh, typical use cases for HSMs. So HSM can be used basically by any application that that has concerns about protecting keys at at runtime. But uh, but typically uh, HSMs are used by signing servers, for example, to sign certificates, uh, and then we don't want the private key to be uh, to be uh, exposed in RAM. Uh, HSMs can be used in key management systems, in CDNs as well. Okay, so HSMs are great. Uh, they protect keys, and it, most of the time also the, they do crypto acceleration. So uh, the cryptography done inside or within an HSM is can be pretty uh, fast because uh, because HSMs use specialized uh, hardware. So they are great at what they are doing. However, they have they come with some constraints. First, they are costly. So there is this is a uh, uh, an additional investment that uh, that uh, uh, users should consider. They are difficult to scale because they are hardware in nature. It's not like scaling software where you can maybe just spin up another VM or uh, right. You you need to have another another physical HSM in order to to be able to 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 scale. There is an operational overhead because if you if uh, if uh, we need to upgrade the firmware, for example, or uh, uh, or um, uh, or do any operations or maintenance on the on the HSM. You need procedures that are different from the the rest of the procedures that an administrator uh, needs to, uh, to to use for the rest of the of the of the servers and the software. And also, more importantly, HSMs are not always an option in public clouds because as a as a tenant in a, in a public cloud, you get a VM, but you don't have typically access to to the hardware. Uh, to uh, to connect your your HSM physical physical HSM. 
Okay. So that's uh, with the HSMs. Uh, the second way to protect keys at uh, at uh, in uh, in use at runtime is to use a network uh, HSM or a key management system. So key management systems is where typically keys are stored when they are not used. And as we mentioned, most key, most key management systems use an attached HSM. Not always. Uh, some might just uh, store the keys on, on, on disk. So it, it depends on the sensitivity of the keys, right? But uh, most commercial HS, uh, sorry, key management systems uh, would typically have a, um, a backend uh, HSM. So the typical uh, example or a flow for using keys that are stored in KMS for the application to retrieve the key at runtime when it needs to use the key and use it, right? But in this case, the keys are eventually get eventually in RAM, and then they will be exposed, and uh, and kind of we would have the same concerns that we that we listed, right? Uh, so, uh, uh, but so if you want to protect keys in use with with a, a when you're using a KMS, there are uh, or most of those key management application protocols allow you actually to uh, perform cryptography in the KMS itself. So in that case, you would send the payload that you uh, you want uh, processing on, like for example, maybe signing some payload or encrypting or decrypting some 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 type of pay payload. So in that case, the payload is sent to the KMS, and the KMS is instructed to do uh, the cryptography. So by in doing this, the 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 keys don't actually need to be exposed in in RAM. So that addresses the concern, but but uh, but there are constraints there as well. Uh, if the application, the client application, always sends the uh, payload to the key management system in order to per perform the cryptography. Uh, then there, there is uh, potentially network latency involved that might not be acceptable uh, in in some instances. Uh, the other issue as well is that in some there are some use cases that might not work with this. Like for example, consider encrypting or de decrypting a large video file. Right or a VM image, right? S sending the whole payload to KMS might not be uh, feasible in in that case. This diagram or this figure like summarizes at a high level uh, the the solutions that we have today to protect keys at uh, uh, in in use when they are actually or actively used. So one of the on the left you see the solution that uses a network HSM or a KMS. So in that case, the uh, user app sends the payload to the KMS and the cryptography is performed there directly with the key. So the key never needs to leave the, the actual KMS. The second option is the attached HSM, as you can see here on the right. So the application using PKCS 11 uh, API can access the key that is, or can refer to the key that is in the HSM and then perform crypto cryptography directly in that attached HSM with, uh, with the key. So in, in both instances, the key is uh, is is protected uh, at, during during use. Uh, and one comment here, one quick comment on PKCS 11 API. So the user app uh, doesn't actually need to be to use this PKCS 11 uh, interface specifically. Uh, in some instances, some of the cryptographic uh, common cryptographic libraries like OpenSSL have a way to translate OpenSSL calls to PKCS 11 transparently. So the developer can still use OpenSSL. Uh, but uh, but uh, the translation to PKCS 11 would happen uh, uh, automatically or transparently. Okay. Okay. So now that we have seen the concerns with uh, using keys in in RAM uh, and uh, the current uh, or the existing solutions to uh, address this problem, we'll look at another way to protect keys in use. Um, and uh, that other uh, mechanism is based on confidential computing and specifically uh, SGX. Okay, so we'll be looking at confidential computing. How can confidential computing uh, help us in, in this case? So first, what is confidential computing? It's basically a computing paradigm that offers isolation, isol isolated areas of execution on, on a server, right? And that isolated area of execution is called the trusted execution environment or TEE. 
the isolation, uh, as we, we have uh, mentioned that in the one of the previous slides, the OS and the hypervisor also do that. But in the case of TEE, that isolation is uh, often enforced by hardware, right? So the, the, there, there are hardware features in the CPU itself that would kind of enforce that isolation. Uh, so uh, the, the uh, confidential computing is a feature that is uh, that that needs to be supported in the in the CPU, right? Not all CPUs support confidential computing, but those that do uh, provide this capability, right? And some examples of technologies that uh, today uh, do or support confidential computing is Intel Software Guard Extension or SGX, uh, AMD SCV. Uh, ARM Trust Zone and AWS Nitro also is another option. Okay, so how do we protect keys in a TEE? And uh, just a quick reminder, a TEE or Trusted Execution Environment is kind of an isolated area of execution that, uh, that um, uh, co the confidential uh, computing feature uh, offers the developer, right? So the idea here is to implement PKCS 11 cryptographic uh, interface in a TEE. That's the idea. Uh, so from client uh, client perspective, from client applications perspective, since this is like the interface is PKCS 11, it looks just like as if they were using an HSM, right? So if they were using HSM to protect their keys, uh, the idea here is to, instead of doing the cryptography and protecting the key in, in an hardware, separate hardware HSM, the idea is to protect the key and do the cryptography in a TEE, right? Uh, so in order to do that, we can have uh, a kind of a shim, software shim, that uh, takes those PKCS 11 calls from the client application and then translates them into, uh, into the, um, the interface uh, that the TEE supports, right? Something that we haven't mentioned, but, uh, but TEEs usually have uh, provide a special way or special or support a special protocol for for uh, client applications to communicate with, right? Uh, so in the next slide we will see uh, how this TEE can be used to protect keys, but specifically uh, using the SGX uh, uh, technology as an example. Uh, so SGX. So uh, quick, basically quick primer on 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 SGX here. Uh, uh we can't cover it in details but you are welcome to go and on the intel website there's a, a whole site uh, that dedicated to the sgx technology sgx uh, uh, at intel uh, at intel uh so uh, the way sgx is sgx um, tees are are packaged uh basically the sgx sdk allows the developer to package the code that would run inside uh, a TEE as as a, a shared library, right? That's the SGX SDK that does the does that magic, right? So from the client application perspective, an SGX TEE or the technical term is SGX Enclave. So SGX Enclave is the kind of the SGX name for SGX TEEs. Uh, so from an application perspective, an SGX TEE is just a shared library, right? And there is an implementation uh, with the link provided below uh, of that PKCS 11 implementation in SGX Monkey. So it's basically from the again from the the application the client application perspective, uh, it's a PKCS 11 library, right? So the application would would still make PKCS 11 calls to that uh, library, but instead of those calls uh, being carried out by a hardware uh, HSM, they would be carried out inside by uh, software running inside an SGX Enclave. So this is the basic idea of the solution, right? And here, this uh, diagram explains uh, at a really high level how these SGX Enclaves uh, work. So as you can see on this diagram, you have a typical system with hardware, VMM, hypervisor, basically, uh, maybe some VM with an OS uh, running on, on that uh, hypervisor and then different applications. As, so you, you, the small, red squares here are the SGX enclaves. And as you can see, uh, the, the hardware, the CPU, uh, ensures that, that the content of these enclaves is not accessible to any software, not even the, the application that uses that enclave. 
let alone other applications. So even the kind of malware is running on that uh, manages to, to run on that server, it won't be able to access those enclaves. But more importantly, even privileged software like the OS and the, the hypervisor uh, can't access the, the content of these enclaves. Only the CPU can do. So, so the idea here with SGX is that those enclaves are protected at all time. And this is done actually by, at a high level, by uh, encrypting regions of memory, uh, those enclaves, uh, they are encrypted with a key that is inside, uh, inside the CPU. So only the CPU can decrypt uh, the content of those uh, enclaves and, and run uh, the corresponding code and access the data, like in this case, keys, cryptographic keys. So this is the idea of with SGX, okay? So now that we have explained the general principle of uh, how the uh, TEE and SGX enclave can be used to protect keys, uh, we might have the question of how are the keys provisioned into the TEE in the first place, right? Uh, so, um, operationally, the, the key can actually still can still be stored in a KMS, right, in key management system. And then when it's needed, uh, there is actually a, a flow that will allow uh, allow you as an, maybe as an admin or a, or your deployment script uh, to um, request CTK to generate a wrapping key, right, to return a public wrapping key. And the corresponding private key would, would still be inside the CTK, which is uh, basically the, the SGX enclave implements PKCS 11. And then that public wrapping key can then be used to wrap the application keys that you need inside CTK, right? Uh, so only only uh, CTK will be able to access those keys, right? And then CTK will return some kind of uh, uh, some ID, key ID that applications can use to access uh, to access the key, right? In PKCS 11, that, that key ID is actually uh, uh, PKCS is called the PKCS 11 URI. So it has a URI uh, format and refers to a specific key, right? So this is how you can provision the key. The, but there is another way that key can be automated uh, or the provisioning of the key can be automated using a feature called SGX attestation. So what is SGX attestation? Again, quickly, uh, SGX attestation is basically a way for a TEE, an SGX TEE or an SGX enclave to prove to a remote party across a network, even across a network, that it is a uh, running in, uh, in in SGX enclave. And it can do, do that by generating what we call an SGX code, which is basically a signed uh, claim that can prove to a remote party that uh, indeed uh, the, 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 the other party is running in an SGX enclave. That SGX code can also contain uh, a wrapping public key uh, or the, the hash of a wrapping public key and the public key can be sent uh, se separately uh, so that the remote party uh, can can um, encrypt or wrap secrets with that uh, wrapping key and send them to the enclave with the assurance that only the enclave can have access to those uh, to those uh, to those secrets right so in in uh, uh, same here there is uh, as at the bottom of the slide here uh, you will have all the you can have all the details but there is basically an implementation we have done an implementation where we have implemented a shim on top of the the uh, CTK uh, library the CTK library right uh, so the shim is uh, called SKC or secure key caching and what that shim does is basically perform an attestation with a remote uh, key management system. Right, and then uh, when the attestation uh, is successful, basically that the remote key management system can can um, uh, validate that the key will be uh, returned to a, uh, an SGX enclave. Uh, then they are wrapped with the public key of the enclave and returned to the enclave. Right. So this basically automate the 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 process of um, of uh, uh, provisioning the key into the enclave. Final slide is, so what do we gain by uh, by using CTK and SKC and in general an SGX uh, enclave in, in this case? So what we gain is that the key, of course, the key, the cryptographic key will be protected in use and that addresses one of, one of the concerns that we had that we listed in the beginning of the presentation. But, but um, SGX, software developed with SGX, like uh, the CTK and SKC, they are still software, besides the fact that they are run in a 
in a, in an enclave, there's still software. So they can they can use all the techniques that are used for the rest of the software in terms of deployment, configuration, uh, software upgrades. Uh, they can scale because it's just software. You can just you just need to uh, spin up another enclave on another maybe on another VM as long as that VM is also running on a server that supports SGX. Uh, that that, that scaling would be possible. So basically, these are the benefits of uh, of, of running uh, software in in an enclave. You get you get pr protection uh, at runtime while you get all the benefits or while uh, th that software integrates with the rest of your software. You don't need a separate procedure to, to manage uh, that, uh, that software. And this wraps this presentation. Thank you everyone for your attention. Uh, I would be happy to answer any questions. I think you have your, my contact information in the slides. Please feel free to reach out to me. I will be happy to help with any questions you might have. Thank you.